Good evening and uh, welcome to what is the first in our 2015 series on neuroscience and society, which is a collaboration between AAAS and the Dana Foundation. My name is Mark Frankel and I am uh, on AAAS staff. I direct the program on scientific responsibility, human rights and law. And I also have the pleasure of welcoming you during Brain Awareness Week. We have the logo up here and the URL in case you want to learn a little bit more. Uh, I'm just going to tell you that if you don't know, Brain Awareness Week is a global campaign which is intended to increase public awareness of uh, the importance uh, of research in neuroscience. This, week's, this week marks its 20th anniversary. Uh, it was founded by the Dana Alliance for Brain Initiatives and involves all sorts of organizations from universities, K through 12, hospitals, uh, professional associations, advocacy groups, and government agencies all engaged in activities aimed at increasing public awareness. Um, and since its inception in 1996, the campaign has actually included the participation of more than 4,800 partners in more than 100 countries. And we're particularly pleased that tonight's event uh, can be uh, another part, or another contribution, if you will, uh, to those activities. Uh, the Tangled Up in Blue, uh, part of the title, uh, which may not have resonated with many of you at the outset, uh, is actually a reference to a Bob Dylan song in which he wrote, we always feel the same, we just saw it from a different point of view. And I feel confident in saying that the songwriter did not or was not thinking of neuroscience at the time, but it does bring to mind tonight's topic, which of course is chronic pain, because I think many in society think about pain as sort of a simple sensation. Uh, but we know as from a scientific point of view that it's very, very complex. It engages many parts of the nervous system and also includes a number of comorbidities, uh, depression being one of them, and hence the reference to uh, blue uh, in the title. Plus, we never fully understand what the individual person who is experiencing pain is actually going through. And I think in many cases it ends up where people feel a bit isolated from family and society. So the complexity is some of what we want to try to get at uh, this evening. The art, by the way, uh, that goes with the, uh, uh, with the flyer that we widely distributed um, was the work of Jen Shiflett, who was an artist in Oakland, California, and she was inspired by an MRI of her spine and she uses art to help her cope with her severe chronic pain. Um, the painting, by the way, was brought to our attention by one of tonight's speakers, Ed Bielski, and we want to thank him for, for doing so and making that available, helping to make that available to us. We have three presentations tonight and one discussant. We'll hold questions until the, uh, later in the program. After the three talks, I'm then going to invite the speakers and the discussant up to the stage for a little bit of conversation among themselves and then we'll open it up to questions uh, from those of you in the audience. And uh, like all of these events, uh, then the series since it began, this one will also be videoed and will be posted on the Dana Foundation website and there'll be a link to it uh, from the AAAS website. Now all of you should have our program and there are extensive bios there so I'm going to uh, skip long introductions so that we can get onto the substance of what people have to share with us tonight. Uh, so there'll be only brief introductions, and so I'm at that point now where I'm going to introduce our first speaker, Dr. David Borsuk, who is Professor of Anesthesia in the Pain Research Group at Boston Children's Hospital. And he's going to be talking about uh, what happens in the brain uh, when we experience pain. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Borsuk. So how, how nice it is to be here. Uh, last time I was here, I think I completely embarrassed myself in public, and so I hope I don't repeat it. But Mark mentioned something about this disconnect between patient and, uh, and doctor. And I've been on both sides of the fence, having seen over 14,000 patients and having had chronic pain for a while myself. And there's a language missing. There's something clearly not happening in the clinic. And there is this disconnect, not only at that level, but between where neuroscience is today and what's happening or not happening in the clinic. And so what I hope to do today is 
if I can work this out. Well, that's a good start. Sorry. I, don't, I can't see, so I don't know where the clicker is. Let's try that, yeah. So what I hope to do today is essentially present to you six um, components of what I think are important <coughs> domains of uh, neuroscience research that are, are changing and will change our views in the clinic. And if you look at pain, uh, the pain system, it's a relatively simple process if you look at it in terms of neural systems, you know, from peripheral nerve getting more compli complicated in the spinal cord, and then it goes into the brain where three major processes take place, sensation, emotional responsivity to that, and the brain's own innate response to inhibiting pain. And I think as we've learned more about the system, it's the emotional changes in the brain that are uh, uh, driving many of the facets comorbidities, and other things that we see in this. And, and this is a, a slide I used um, a while ago, and I just want to make the point that while there are all these many pains, uh, we're not kind of directing resources at the big ones and the common ones. So for example, migraine is probably the most common chronic pain or pain condition. Uh, some 29 or whatever, 36 million people Diabetic painful neuropathy is a big one. So is back pain. And, and these are conditions that we really don't have a handle on. I mean, it's hard to believe that we've had them for years and we are not treating them effectively. And there's just quickly, and I'll, I'll, I'll delve into them in, 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 in subsequent slides, this notion of pain begetting depression and depression begetting pain. You can be depressed and have never had pain in your life and you can then have a generalized pain sy syndrome and then something that is close to my heart and interest is pain in children because we just think of them as little people having pain, but the consequences as they get into adults are huge and, uh, and, and, and in fact untapped in terms of how we've understood that. Similarly with gender, although much more work has been done in that domain. And so uh, a couple of years ago, um, we put this paper together and I'm just using it as the theme of, of tonight's talk about you know, transforming pain medicine, because at the end of the day, we'd like to take as e every patient and be able to say, we know what to do for you and you, and do it in a way where the benefits are huge. And the problem we have now is we don't know how to choose patients appropriately, whether they'll be responders or non-responders. And ideally, we'd like to understand the dimensions of change within each patient in terms of sleep, uh, appetite, anxiety, depression, and if it essentially have a quick barcode, which means you go to counter A to pick up drug or treatment B to get better. And so in one slide, there are so many advances going on in the pain field, in basic science, from growing pain, pain um, neurons in a Petri dish to stem cells, which are being used to uh, connect uh, spinal cord uh, damage in, in pain patients, uh, and this huge domain in genetics. And then what I've called integrative science uh, relates to a couple of domains. One is what has been uh, termed by Bruce McEwen uh, at the Rockefeller Institute of allostatic load, which means as we have more stresses, and you can read stresses, sleep, uh, pain, uh, any component like that on our systems, we eventually develop a load where the system fails. It's kind of like heart failure. And the more you have on it, the worse it gets, and the worse it gets the more sensitive you are. And part of this relates to the, the field now of, of what's called genetics as, as defined by Time magazine and, and how these are beginning to interact. And that's become a huge domain in, in neuroscience in general and in the pain field. And then in applied sciences, uh, this, this notion, especially with missing limbs, but it applies to even damaged neurons on how we can provide feedback to the central nervous system to correct its disarray that occurs obviously in phantom limb. And, and, fan, and, and prosthetic limbs are beginning to change that not just because they're functional, but because they can provide input that seems to be useful. Uh, and more recently, especially from Oxford in England, but other places uh, in the United States as well, 
deep brain stimulation, vagus nerve stimulation, all these stimulations are going on uh, in an attempt to recalibrate and reorganize uh, brain systems. So what I'm going to do until I'm thrown off the stage is go through s these six domains, which I think are big deals in terms of where the field is going. And uh, I'll start off at the top at 12 o'clock and wind clockwise um, uh, through them. So the first one of plasticity of the brain and the nerve. I mean, if you think back 10 or 15 years ago, the notion that the brain was this adaptive plastic organ that could be changed quickly by just learning to juggle, to juggle. You could show changes uh, essentially within, with, within uh, days and presumably now even with hours. But brain imaging has done a number of things which I've summarized on the left, and that is that it captures the pain experience. In other words, not the nociceptive experience, but the pain experience, which includes emotional and other factors. Um, it, it's an integrative process. We've learned about um, uh, protective systems in this. We've learned about reward and anti-reward systems. We've learned about new diagnostic definitions of it. And we've learned a lot about the placebo response. And I'm not going to talk to those things except to say that brain imaging has done all of this and it has really put the biology or neurobiology of the placebo system into neural systems in the human context. But I want to give you an example from work uh, done by colleagues in our group, looking at rapid plasticity in a condition called complex regional pain syndrome, which essentially is you twist your ankle, you stretch a nerve, and you develop this horrendous pain syndrome where you can't touch a limb, it spreads up the limb, it may spread to the whole body, you may have autonomic changes, you may have movement changes. In other words, stretching a nerve has done a whole lot of things that can only take place in, in the brain, and in other words, that has caused this cascade of events uh, to do that. And at, at Boston Children's Hospital, they have a program, I think it's the first in the country, um, where they put these kids who are non-responders to, to outpatient uh, therapy through a three-week program where they stay on the same medications, but they push through a heavy-duty gulag-type uh, um, uh, exercises, physical therapy, as well as uh, um, um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and so forth. And essentially in three weeks, these kids are not only better, but their brains have changed. So I don't have the, um, here we go. So this is before on the left column in each one and, and after their treatment. And what we are, are, are seeing here and listed here, well, well at the top you see the swollen limb and then it's better in three weeks, but you have these abnormal changes in the brain in particular networks, I use the sensory motor one because it's more uh, uh, um, synergistic with our understanding of what it may mean. And essentially you have normality of these circuits. It doesn't mean that they aren't still up for being sensitized if they then twist their ankle again, but they've changed in a way where we now have an objective readout for these patients and, and now can begin to look at responders and non-responders. And those are functional changes. So these are brain images which we map on uh, activity uh, that occurs in the brain with pain and then uh, after their treatment. In the next slide, we also see huge changes in brain volume. And don't read this as neuronal loss. I think the, the, the way to read it is akin to trees in summer full of leaves and therefore a bigger volume and trees in winter that have lost their leaves with loss of volume, and here we see uh, loss of volume in, in an area known as the accumbens, which is an uh, important brain region involved in rewarding uh, and other emotional processes. And then with treatment, we see changes in a region known as the putamen, which actually is involved in all analgesic and pain processing for reasons that are not totally clear, and, and usually a positive or increased uh, change in uh, function, but also increase in volume reflects a beneficial um, effect. So the way we're trying to look at this, and it probably happens for many diseases in adults with successful treatment, but in kids, they're more responsive, they're more plastic, is that you have a normal healthy brain, you have an injury, these networks disintegrate, uh, and then with treatment over time, they recalibrate towards normal, perhaps not 
completely normal, but certainly in terms of sensory and functional activity, they are much better. And, and there are the beginnings of new applications of imaging into the clinic. Neurosurgery was the first to do this for surgical planning uh, before surgery. And I just chose examples from Karen Davis's lab uh, where <coughs> essentially looking at a difficult pain problem, trigeminal neuralgia, that's shooting, stabbing pain that occurs in some patients, and being able to now measure changes uh, at the time uh, of surgery and now uh, to look at the effects <coughs> later on to see uh, how these uh, get better. So we have a functional measure of, of a pain system that can now be adapted in the clinic, and there are many examples of it, but I thought that was a nice one. The, the, the second blip on the, on the radar for me is uh, this notion of two domains. I've chosen two examples. You can read the numbers here. 54 million surgeries a year in the United States. 10 to 40 percent of these end up with chronic pain. Migraine, 30 million in the country. It's number seven on the world's health list of uh, all diseases. And in case I, <coughs> I don't have time to tell you, certainly on, in recent uh, data sets, it is a condition which is in the top three of causes for suicide. Now, who would have thought that? But the point being is that pain in itself is a big driver for that, and some of these conditions are even bigger. So if you look at um, surgery, this is the incidence of chronic pain. You can take it, whatever, 5 to 85 percent, but it's around 15 to 40 on average, with severe pain around 5 percent. So 5% of 50 million surgeries a year is a big number. And yet we're actually not doing as much as we should be doing in a process which is at our, it's, it's a la carte. We know when people are gonna have surgeries, we know what's going to happen, and it's been one of the big domains that there still is a need uh, uh, to deal with it. And um, <clears throat> the genetics of surgery, I mean, these are domains that I think are happening out there that are, are going to contribute to better outcomes. The first is uh, an example. There, there are others from Clifford Wolf's lab, uh, who's also at Children's now, in terms of genetics, looking at um, these uh, 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 processes which regulate sensitivity and persistence. And when you have a pain-protective haplotype, you actually have less pain. Uh, then, then less pain uh, uh, in the weeks after surgery, 24 weeks, you see this, this difference um, compared with those that have more of these alleles in their genetic makeup. And, and there's actually been a, a large number of studies that have come out that way um, and will be able to be adapted, adapted to the clinic. The second is a domain that may sound like a funny word, it always has to me, uh, except for psychologists lo love it, but this term catastrophizing is the best predictor of whether you'll have a good or bad outcome from surgery and various other things. So it somehow captures your brain state of worrying and various other interoceptive processes that then are manifest as a bad outcome uh, for these patients. But it's the best predictor right now of, of a poor outcome in surgery. And, and then a domain that we're interested in, and that is during surgery, no one knows where the pain messages get to your brain. And if they do get to the brain, are they beginning to unfurl a whole lot of embers that continue to burn that become part of the pain process? And, and we've now successfully been able to show that you can actually measure nociceptive signals that reach the brain under anesthesia, even though patients are lying still, and obviously hope, hoping to be able to put this into a process where the surgeon or anesthesiologist can see blip, 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 red, red light, you know, slow down, do something, but hopefully learn how to block it completely. With respect to migraine, it's funny that, um, you know, I said that migraine's a big deal. We don't really have great treatments for chronification of migraine where it processes from one, one to 14 headache days a month to more than that. But this field, I think, is taking off in a, in a good way, and I've just tried to summarize various things, including genes that have been defined in it, this domain of uh, neurophysiology, and I'm going to tell you about one that actually is clinically important, um, that 
There are new drugs that are in phase two and three trials that look very interesting and, 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 and useful for the field. And we're still trying to understand a lot of these issues of gender, children, you know, transformation of migraine as kids go through puberty, and, and then uh, ours and uh, others, some of whom are in the audience, interest in migraine imaging and, and so forth. So here are some examples, you know, genes and migraine, a group from uh, Utah and I think South Carolina, Carolinas and, and, and uh, California put out a paper in translational neuroscience on uh, mutations of this enzyme and its association with sleep. And for those of us in the clinic with any migraine, uh, you know, the two things you can do to get them better on track is exercise and sleep. If you get those two things going, you're gonna do well with most of them and certainly in kids. And then gender, this is a graph of showing female preponderance in terms of prevalence uh, through puberty uh, compared with males. And <clears throat> there are brain changes in, in adults, certainly, and in kids um, showing changes, in this case, in the insula and, and, and other, uh, other areas that are clearly different in women and men, suggesting that the disease itself may have a different profile or sensitivity. But I wanted to mention the issue of this allodynia. So, so the, what happens in migraineurs is that there's a process of peripheral sensitization where you have a migraine attack and anything like light and what have you, uh, sorry, and you have some sensitivity because of this pain input into the trigeminal system. But then you may have focal allodynia where just touching the face, right, even outside of the area of the innervation of <coughs> the, the trigeminal vascular system produces pain, and we think that's because of sensitization of neurons in the, in the brainstem, and then your whole body can become sensitized to light, you know, touch, brush, and so forth. And when that happens, uh, the central sensitization involves more rostral areas in the brain. And so what is important about this is that there's a correlation between allodynia and the worsening of the disease. So patients have more depression, they have a higher likelihood of, chroni of chronifying uh, with the disease. Um, and then lastly, just this theme of why does light make my pain worse during migraine? So that question was actually answered by a colleague, Remy Burstein, through a, a finding showing that there were pathways from the retina into the thalamus that then uh, converged with pain fibers coming in from the trigeminovascular system so that light and sound and smell uh, do these things in migraineurs where they make the pain of the migraine state uh, worse. And as it turns out, even in chronic migraine, these processes may not be as acute, but are still uh, uh, present. <clears throat> the, this issue, which I briefly mentioned at the beginning, is becoming really a, a major, uh, not new, but certainly a, a new focus in many labs, particularly uh, groups in England, where um, this figure comes from, uh, where they actually produced a nerve injury in a pup and showed that the adolescent rats actually had pain as they uh, developed. And we've known this in humans, uh, kids uh, who are abused, kids who have circumcision, actually are more sensitive, even immunizations, as it turns out, make them more sensi sensitive uh, to pain in, 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 later, in later years. And so this whole issue of pain um, uh, in, t in terms of these prevalence rates that are quite high in kids, you know, even for um, uh, most of these conditions, produce these long-term consequences where not only may there be altered development, but particularly these issues of future psychological uh, uh, pro problems. And, and these long-lasting physiological consequences have been shown in, 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 in a number of studies now, and it's the, the thought, obviously, is that it changes circuits. And the two main circuits that people are focusing on are fear circuits, which involves an area of the brain known as amygdala, and this reward circuitry, where, which involves the um, nucleus accumbens, and we were lucky enough to be, I think, the first or amongst the first to show that the nucleus accumbens actually is involved in rewarding slash aversive stimuli. 
And so at, at Children's, we've started this program, <coughs> Save the Child's Brain, where we want to look at issues that occur early on and how they may manifest uh, later on. Prediction and outcome is, is another area that uh, neuroscience has begun to, to tackle in a big way. And the two domains are, you know, why <coughs> am I such a weenie and will develop pain, whereas um, Mark will never have pain, whatever you throw at him, because he's resilient. And that's because he has all these things lined up, right, and, and I don't. And it is a big issue. Why do some people succumb to the same thing, you know, surgical incision, herniography, whatever, and, and others don't in terms of the development of chronic pain. And it, in, it encompasses a whole lot of things, including epigenetics. And I just gave you, uh, I mean, I just list here two papers that are recent in terms of beginning to look at how simple things can change uh, this profile. So in terms of prediction, I'm just going to jump to one uh, it, that relates to imaging, where Vanya Karian's group looked at uh, functional connectivity in, in patients who presented with acute back pain and looked at those who went on to chronic back pain and could predict with high level of <clears throat> uh, high level those patients who would go on. But there are other things that uh, are in this domain in terms of, of prediction of pain. The second to last domain relates to uh, the psycho psychiatric uh, components. And the problem we have in medicine is the, the, the sort of columnization of you, you go to, um, you know, your depression doctor for depression, and you go to your pain doctor for pain, and you go to your toe doctor for toes, or whatever it is. And we all just focus on those things. And so the integrative process in medicine is missing. And as a result, many, many of these things are still in these other domains. And um, I think that it is very hard to understand that most of us trained in pain are not trained in psychology or psychiatry. And it's my own belief that actually psychiatrists are probably the best placed to treat chronic pain patients for their knowledge of drugs that are mostly used, as well as their knowledge of brain processes. But here are two domains that are, are pushing the field forward in that, and, that, and the one is that you know, dopamine levels, the accumbens, these, these areas involved in reward, uh, are clearly uh, influencing pain affect or the emotionality of pain and emotional systems that drive it. And the second one uh, from a group in uh, Montreal looking at chronic pain uh, as it relates to stress, going back to that Bruce McEwen domain, that cortisol and other levels. Uh, are part of this process that change uh, the brain systems. And, and just briefly, this issue of suicidality, you know, if you look at the, um, the numbers, four to, five, four to six fold increases compared with healthy patients uh, of the suicide rate uh, uh, in, in these domains. And uh, again, it's sort of like pain contributing to the, the evolution of depression. And, and that becoming an unstoppable process for some patients. Do I have another minute? Yeah. So uh, the whole field of developing new drugs or developing new therapies has been limited by metrics. Like, how do we know whether you're a responder or not a responder? How do we know whether the drug acts? Does this drug have long or short-term effects? And here are just some insights into it. Uh, the first is, Sometimes we think drugs work, and I'm kind of setting David up a little bit, um, and, and yet they have bad effects on the brain. So this is the effect of uh, chronic morphine, or chronic opioids, showing changes in, in this case in the amygdala, but it changes these circuits. So the question is, am I a bad responder in terms of how my brain is affected and then become an addict, or am I resilient to the drug and I'll do well? The second example relates to work that comes out of um, Rick Harris's uh, group, which actually is one of the first to show that you could use chemical measures in the brain to predict responders and non-responders in uh, to a, a commonly used drug. Um, uh, and, and, and this is the kind of work that is needed across the field. And then lastly, 
uh, our animal models have been in La La Land because many of them have been looking at acute responses to pain or acute responses in, animal, in chronic models of pain. Uh, but uh, uh, groups such as uh, Frank Pereka and others have begun to look at um, uh, processes where you're looking at the whole animal's behavior, and I think this is a transformative uh, approach to the development of, of drugs. So I hope I've given you a six-part snippet of where the field may be going, and ideally we'd like an antibiotic with great specificity and sensitivity to pain, and I have to thank many people for being here, including the organizers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Borsek. I think we're off to a good start uh, to provide us with some context for our next speakers. The next one of whom is Dr. Edward Bilski, who is <coughs> Professor of Pharmacology in the College of Osteopathic Medicine and Vice President for Research and Scholarship at the University of New England. And he's going to focus primarily on chronic pain treatment and management. Dr. Bielski. So good afternoon, evening, and uh, it's a real great pleasure to be here as part of this group. I want to start with uh, some thank yous. And uh, first and foremost is our sponsors. Uh, I'm lucky to be associated with both the AAAS and the Dana Foundation, and also the Society for Neuroscience. And the coordination of these resources have really I think brought uh, you know, the Brain Initiative forward to the point where it is today. And uh, I would be remiss in not thanking the National Institutes of Health, including NIGMS, which uh, sponsors our uh, very large uh, COBRE grant, which is an infrastructure building grant specific to states like Maine, that has been extraordinarily helpful, not just for the basic science work that we're all doing, uh, but for many other things that have, have kind of followed along, including the uh, public outreach. And, uh, and then obviously the University of New England as well, which has been a, a big supporter of this. I've been, uh, my life has changed uh, by uh, collaborations and connections. Uh, two books that have had enormous impact on uh, the way I've been thinking about chronic pain is first the Institute of Medicine report, I think it came out in 2011. It identified a major problem, uh, but more importantly, it gave us a blueprint to solve that problem. And it was multimodal because pain is, as uh, David Borsuk said, incredibly complex and it's gonna take many different approaches and many different institutions uh, working together. Uh, the other one is a close colleague of mine, Dan Carr, who unfortunately cannot be here today because he's at the uh, uh, AAPM uh, pain medicine meeting. Uh, but he turned me on to narrative medicine. I always thought narration, uh, when we talk about a grant, we talk about numbers, we talk about how serious the problem is, then lead into our hypothesis. But it's really about listening, and, and listening in a lot of different formats, uh, written language, and, and listening to people who actually suffer from these chronic diseases. And it's not just the pain, it's the suffering component too. I think that gives us great insight into studying this at a more holistic level as well, and I'll touch on that. Uh, some disclosures, I, uh, I'm a, an entrepreneur, uh, started two small biotech companies that have uh, uh, indications in the pain and addiction space. Uh, it's been encouraged by my university. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the uh, presentation. And I also work uh, closely with biotech and pharma industry. Uh, I think that has in, also given me a lot of insights that I otherwise wouldn't have as an academic scientist. And it shows me the challenges of drug development uh, for the pain space. Uh, it's not that uh, we're going to give up, uh, but it also tells us that we have to be cautious and we have to persevere uh, and we have to think maybe a little bit differently. Uh, another disclosure, I am uh, uh, very proud to be part of what has become a very large institute at our uh, university. Uh, and it's not just the basic scientists, some of whom are here in attendance today. Uh, we involve uh, all the different healthcare practitioners that see people and treat people that are in chronic pain. Uh, there's philosophers and musicians and artists uh, and others that are in our community and, and through collaboration. And that's, again, very important. I think it's a very robust uh, center uh, because of our diversity of thinking. So I'm going to get a little personal. I'm going to take you back to 1969. And I was just a wee little lad. And uh, I remember very vividly, this is one of my first memories, my parents had a, a thing, a cough medicine. It was yellow and it tasted really good. So at some point they must have given it to me for a cough. And I associated that yellow color with something sweet tasting. And uh, I ended up drinking a bottle of it. This was before safety caps. So uh, you know, practically, uh, this is right about the time that they started to implement safety caps. 
Uh, so that's you know, kind of an engineering thing. There was a problem. People were taking baby aspirin. Kids were taking baby aspirin. It was good tasting. And people were taking cough medicine that, that shouldn't. And uh, the other thing was that Narcan was not available at the time. It was just starting to be introduced into emergency rooms. So my parents brought me to the emergency room. And I ended up uh, having to sleep it off because there was no antidote at the time. So I think it shows you that we can solve problems uh, practically through engineering and also through good rational drug design, medicinal chemistry, pharmacology, and uh, drug development. We're, we're better off because of these two kind of breakthroughs. I'm going to take you guys back in time. How many of you remember your first bee sting? I remember it very vividly. I was probably about four or five. I can tell you the exact setting. I was at a friend's house. I was between the oleanders and this horrible, hideous uh, green vinyl siding of the house. And this bumblebee landed right here on my forearm. And I thought it was really cool up until the moment it stung me. <laughs> and I've probably been stung about four or five additional times through my life. And I, I bet you I can pinpoint all, at least four of them uh, down to very specifics of the setting. And it just shows you how powerful our nervous system is, even to an acute painful stimulus. It imprinted something in our brain uh, that, that stays with us for a lifetime. And it's not something that I can ever forget. So if someone says, just you know, deal with your pain, forget about it, you can't. It is part of you for the rest of your life. People understand bee stings because they've experienced them. People can empathize with someone who has broken a bone in their body. They can understand it. They can see an x-ray. They can see a cast. What about a surgery? I think this one's interesting. I just realized there's no anesthesiologist in this picture, so I don't know if I want to be this patient. Uh, but you know, the point is, we understand when people have surgeries, there's expected to be post-operative pain. And as David elegantly stated, uh, there may be persistent pain because of nerve damage and other factors that contribute to long-lasting pain after the surgery. But do we understand and do we empathize as much with the person who's got chronic daily headaches or migraine? Are we a little bit afraid of it? Do we think that this person might be complaining or just wants to go home early or just can't deal with stress? And then take it a step further. How about the fibromyalgia patient or the low back patient where there's no ready diagnosis? Maybe the conventional MRIs are not showing something. The x-rays don't show anything. There's no blood test you can order. So that's where this gray area gets. And Dan Carr has turned me on to this concept that as a pack, you know, we feel empathy for someone when they're acutely sick. But if they start bringing down the herd, they feel it, and we feel it, and we isolate them. And that contributes to the depression, the anxiety, and that downward spiral that changes the brain. So this is not me. This is, uh, this is, I'm going to lead into how, as an undergraduate, I got involved with neuroscience. I was a physics major, and I was not a very good one. And I was lucky to take a course in alcohol and drug abuse uh, with one of the most fabulous mentors, Larry Reed, at uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. And he had his uh, just a way of taking these bad physics majors and turning them into very good pharmacologists. And he had spent many years in the uh, 60s into the 70s studying reward systems. And he made this connection with ingestive behaviors and the endogenous opioid systems. And he started to think about this from the standpoint of alcoholism and binge drinking. And he laid down a framework with some very careful work to suggest that um, small endogenous opioid surges might increase bouts of ingestion. And if you block that with antagonists, you might curb it or reduce the craving and reduce the binge-type drinking. And luckily, a couple of clinicians uh, at Yale and at UPenn uh, were tracking his basic science research, and they did some clinical trials with naltrexone that led to its approval. But what was amazing about uh, Larry Reed was he was not just a good pharmacologist psychologist. He also understood the importance that this was not a magic bullet. This was not a standalone treatment. This was a treatment to be combined with behavioral, cognitive, and other types of psychotherapy that would help people be resilient to the next uh, craving for alcohol. And so I got to see very early in my academic career basic science. I was at the tail end of his alcohol studies and at the start of these clinical trials, but the practicality of this whole approach. And uh, you know, sometimes we lose sight of kind of using that older classical approach, hypothesis-driven approach uh, to solving problems. I've also had the, fortunate, uh, have the fortune of being associated with Frank Pereca at Arizona, and he put me in touch with Wolfgang Sade, who was a professor at UCSF. He thought differently about these opioid receptors. He couldn't reconcile why some of the classical signs and symptoms of opioid dependence and opioid withdrawal could, be, could not be explained by classic pharmacology. 
And uh, he reached out to our group and we started to collaborate. And uh, this led to a long series of basic science discoveries that looked at how opioid receptors were regulated uh, with chronic opioid exposure. And this whole concept of constitutive activity, the receptors could start signaling in the absence of ligand or agonist like morphine. And so we got to a point where I had to step out of my comfort zone and uh, with, with Wolfgang's help and with the University of New England's help, we realized we were at a point where we needed to start drug development. We, we felt secure in the findings that we had and we thought they had therapeutic applications and we needed to move this forward to testing in humans to see if it actually worked. So one of the things was we formed a company and uh, we, we started to go towards a clinical trial. And we conducted two uh, small clinical trials looking at methadone maintenance patients and looking at healthy normals getting acute morphine and looking to see how this uh, antagonist interacted with uh, the morphine. And so we published those. We also had to go get patents, which no one had trained me. Uh, it's a whole different style of writing, but it's a necessary aspect of the drug development uh, process. And so we, this is one of our more recent uh, we issued patents. This relates to something that's very personal in Maine, too, and this is one of the reasons we formed the company in Maine. We were aware of data in the public health sector that there was a high incidence of opioid use and opioid misuse in the state of Maine. We're in the top uh, quartile here in terms of uh, prescribed opioids uh, being given uh, to the citizens of Maine. And we also have the distinction of being number one in the nation uh, for the use of long-acting opioids. And I make the point, this is not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. It's a thing you need to think about. And so it could be, I don't know if it comes as a surprise, but Maine is the number one oldest state in the country in terms of mean age and the number of uh, percentage of the population over 65. So maybe there's some uh, correlation between aging and higher incidence of chronic pain. I think it has more to do with this, though. Uh, <laughs> this is the winter from hell for both Boston and uh, many parts of Maine. And all that shoveling probably adds up uh, with the uh, epigenetics and the environment. Uh, so that could play a role, too. And there's probably many other factors that might contribute to that. But we need to look at that closer. Another area that out of my comfort zone, I'm a basic scientist, but I teach medical students and pharmacists and a number of other healthcare practitioners that prescribe. So I need to stay up with the, the clinical literature. And I was kind of fascinated by some of these trends. This is a little bit older data. And it's basically saying that if you look state to state to state, there's a high degree or uh, a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of uh, differences in prescribing of opioids. And, and why is that? If you know, we think that the pain burden is evenly spread throughout the United States, why is there so much variability? And it's interesting. They, looked at uh, populations in Europe, uh, country to country to country, and also Australia, and they didn't see that variation. But in the United States, state to state to state, there was high variability. So that's something we can, as a medical uh, college and a university that you know, trains the future physicians, and other uh, practitioners, start to get a handle on. Why are we prescribing at such a different rate? Uh, this is data from Leslie Oaks, who's in our College of Pharmacy. And uh, Leslie looked at a population in Maine that were going uh, under uh, total knee replacement. And what was fascinating about her data set, which tracks, I think, from 2006 to 2010, there was a general significant increase in the amount of opioids that were prescribed at the time of surgery. So a general trend to increase. It was highly variable. So there were some prescriptions that were for less than five pills and others that were over 200 pills. So again, showing the kind of that national trend, there's variability even within the state of Maine for the same type of procedure. What was most fascinating was this population was groups that were opioid naive prior to the surgery. So they went into the surgery with pain, but it was being managed without opioids. They were put on opioids, and a significant percentage of them were still on opioids four months later. So what happened? The surgery was supposed to take care of the pain. They're supposed to heal and get back to normal and not have to take opioids. So either the surgery did more harm than good, maybe it was uh, that the opioids actually produced what we call hyperalgesia, or there might be a substance abuse problem. We need to tease that out, and we have to better educate prescribers and surgeons on post-operative pain management, not just giving blanket prescriptions and not monitoring. So um, I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit into some other work that I find fascinating, and that's on cognitive effects. Uh, you know, uh, we already had a little bit on that. I'm just going to kind of touch on that. 
This review paper says that there's convergence between the animal literature, we can put animals into chronic pain states, and we study humans in chronic pain states. And we're seeing rewiring of the brain, we're seeing changes in neurochemistry that we can monitor uh, non-invasively now. So they you know, come down to saying that there's probably a lot of different things going on. David mentioned the neuroplasticity as being one of the big ones. We're very interested as pharmacologists in understanding the cell signaling and uh, you know, some of the epigenetics, uh, some of the uh, changes in protein expression. And there's also this thought that there's only so much bandwidth in our central nervous system. And if pain is dominating that, that takes away from other things that you want to be able to do. I'll get back to that in just a minute. Um, they're now looking at uh, chronic pain patient populations and on various tasks that involve learning and memory and decision making. So this is just one example of a recent study that basically shows that people in chronic pain have impaired learning abilities and they also don't make decisions as well as someone that's not in chronic pain. That becomes fascinating because we want shared decision making. We want the patient and the provider to work together to choose things that are going to hopefully lead to the best outcomes for that individual patient but their ability to understand and grasp a serious diagnosis with comorbidities and with analgesics on board that can interfere with cognition, that can kind of really make a very special population. We need to make decision-making decision tools that will allow this population to make a better shared decision. Uh, David has already covered some of the, uh, the brain changes. This is another recent study that basically shows that low back pain patients have this uh, function in circuitry, but there's hope. When they started to do uh, treatments, either surgical or local injections of uh, anesthetics, they started to see recovery, that these circuits would get back to normal. I'd love to see if exercise and some of the other non-surgical, non-pharmacological treatments do something similar. I bet you they do. I also monitor safety because as, you know, lecturing to the medical students, uh, it's important for them to stay up on the latest literature. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a series of articles that caught my attention. This is one set of them that was looking at older adults that had non-malignant chronic pain, and they were on different opioid medications. And what was interesting about the data was that you've heard about the COX-2 inhibitors, uh, Celebrex and Vioxx. Vioxx was taken off the market. And it was because of this elevation in cardiovascular risk profile uh, that uh, you know, kind of made the FDA very aware of an incidence of increased heart attacks and strokes. And where did the opioids fall? Is it below this, in between, or above? And what they found retrospectively, so there's caveats to this, but retrospectively they found an enhanced elevation in cardiovascular effects, fractures, osteopenia, all-cause mortality and morbidity, and increased hospitalizations. So this is an area of concern. Now, again, there's limitations of retrospective data. Who is going to pay for the prospective studies that adequately power the trial and take it out long enough to answer the question? Are there subsets of people who are going to benefit from opioids? And are there patient populations that are not going to benefit and you might actually be doing more harm? We need to have that information. Australia is sponsoring what's called the POINT study, which is the first really robust prospective study. It's going to last over a year in length for the uh, randomized patients that are going into this. So we're awaiting those results. So if I've not taken myself out of my comfort zone enough, I'm going to go one step further. So not a fish out of water, a lobster out of water. And uh, we, uh, Ian Meng is in attendance here. He is the PI in this big NIH COBRA grant. And when we announced it, uh, we got a lot of calls from the public. They wanted to enroll in our clinical drug trials uh, because they were desperate. They were in horrible chronic pain. I could have called him back and just said, I'm sorry, we don't have a clinical trial. It's all basic science. But I said, I had a realization. I had spent 20 years of my life studying pain, and I never had a meaningful conversation with a chronic pain patient. And I said, that's got to change. Um, if, I, you know, if I'm going to uh, continue to do this. And so one of the first mothers of this young lady uh, emailed me, and she said, if there's anything we can do to help uh, others like Paula, uh, we want to do it. And so we, we built a relationship. We brought her out to the University of New England. She spoke in front of a 1,000 of our students in an interprofessional setting. Dave Thomas was in attendance. She, unfortunately, does not have a good outcome. At 13, she twisted that ankle. No one believed her. No one listened to her. Her first primary care physician, you're 13 years old, suck it up. That's not a very good bedside manner. It was a physical therapist that suggested reflex sympathetic dystrophy. They went to another primary care physician, an old timer that just didn't keep up with the medical literature. I don't believe in those newfangled diagnoses. That's unfortunate. It took 18 months for her to finally get a definitive diagnosis 
By then, they had lost the window to intervene. She's now in her mid-20s, completely devastated, horrible quality of life, basically homebound 90% of the time. You can see, finally, people started to believe her when her legs swelled, sores developed. She started bleeding all the time. And you know, just imagine that quality of life. The allodynia, we talk about it in animal models, riding an elevator, the pr small pressure change, excruciating pain in her leg. Sue Gold's in attendance. She's from Saco, Maine. And she talks about her rheumatoid arthritis that came on in 1990s, undiagnosed for about a year and a half. She luckily got relief finally with a good pharmacological agents, methotrexate. She talks about very vividly, she's a writer, about the fog that enveloped her. It took her fabric of her life and she couldn't think day to day, week to week, month to month. Everything was centered on the pain, nothing else made sense. She also had an interaction where she was getting out of a car one day and uh, this uh, gentleman who was homeless uh, came up to her. She was wincing, obviously, kind of getting out of the car slowly. And he said, basically, he looked her straight in the eye, by the way, first person, not her family members, not her per uh, physicians, not her friends, a homeless man looking her straight in the eye and said, it looks like your knee hurts. I hope you get better. She had this moment of clarity. This is someone worse off than I am. I've got to do something for other people who have chronic pain. She formed a chronic pain support group. It's in its 21st, 22nd year. Um, and she's working very closely with the University of New England to better educate all of our healthcare practitioners uh, about what it's like to be in pain. Take it a step further. My mom has chronic pain. Had it since 1980 or thereabouts. I was very small, eight years, nine years old. She kept it from me. So either I was too insensitive to pick up how it was impacting her life, I was too scared to ask her about it, or she didn't want to bother her son with the burden that she was facing. At points when the medical profession, professionals did not listen to her, uh, she became very depressed, very isolated, very anxious about it all. Luckily, she had a surgeon in Boston that believed what she was saying, went in for a second set of surgeries uh, uh, with the hip replacement that uh, had degenerated very, uh, very severely. She's better now, thankfully. Here's another success story. This is Amelia, 11 years old, twists an ankle, pain gets out of control. The parents had the wherewithal to ask a lot of people. I got in touch with them about that time. And they got a referral down to Boston Children's Hospital, the pediatric pain group. Unbelievable, I've gotten to visit there. This group uh, is changing people's lives for the better. It was occupational therapy, physical therapy, and behavioral cognitive therapy that has made this young woman pain-free a year later and back to no restrictions on her activity. My dad, back pain, last five years of his life. He's now uh, 89 years old. He wants to live in his own house. A back brace of all things. He tried injections, ablations, every opiate you can name. It was the back brace that was tried almost last. It worked, it helped, and a rarely used opiate called levorphanol. So luckily he had a prescriber or a physician that they stuck with each other. They tried a lot of different things and finally got something that got his uh, life back. So I'll finish by just saying we are doing so much around brain awareness and outreach to the public. Using our students, they're our best ambassadors and spokespeople. Uh, we're preventing concussions, we're preventing brain injuries, and we're having our students tell stories about their personal effects. We're using art and artists to convey some of this information. This is Moses Chow, he's the president of the Society for Neuroscience, past president. He is introducing uh, some speakers. You have brain art from three, uh, you know, third and fourth graders. Um, and that was really neat to see them on display along with you know, some professional artists. So here's the reference to Bob Dylan. We gotta think about pain as complex with multifacets, dates back to the Cubist movement and Picasso, and uh, we've gotta treat it uh, comprehensively. This is my dad again, looking in through the outside. I will never understand exactly what he's going through, but if I start to kind of pull back some of the layers, it starts to brighten up. I understand he's living in his own house. He wants to stay there. He wants to have a quality of life with his grandkids. He wants a life. And for us to understand that, we gotta look through windows, through screens, through dirty windows, through shades and all that. But when we do, we learn something, and that informs our science, I believe. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bielski.
Uh, our next speaker is Dr. David Thomas, Deputy Director, Division Director in the Division of Clinical Neuroscience and Behavior Research at NIH's National Institute on Drug Abuse. And he's going to be telling us a bit about what the government is doing to promote research on chronic pain. Okay. Uh, good evening. I'd like to thank uh, Dane Foundation AAAS for having me here and for putting on this event. And I'd just like to start by saying, Ed, I remember Paula and I still talk about her and her struggles and it, it really is tragic and it's important for us to remember who we're working for and who we're trying to help. Um, I don't have a title, sorry. <laughs> so, but. Um, I'm going to be talking about the larger pictures of what the government's trying to do to help people in pain and, and some of the larger initiatives and some of the bigger problems that we're facing, not just pain, but prescription drug abuse. Um, I'm with the National Institute on Drug Abuse, but I'm also a founding member of the NIH Pain Consortium, which is kind of, there's no pain institute. There's been a big push to try, try to get a pain institute. We never got one, but we're kind of a virtual pain institute. We work across the borders of our, of our institutes. Um, Ed mentioned the um, um, IOM report came out in 2011, really asking for broad, sweeping changes in pain in America. Pain is not treated very well. Our healthcare providers are not educated on the average very well about pain, and it's calling for a cultural shift in that. Um, it uh, indicates that there's a, about 100 million people in chronic pain. I get eye roll when um, you hear that sometimes, but there really are about 100 million Americans in chronic pain. It has a big cost to society in terms of dollars, but also just cost in terms of human suffering. Okay, but then we have another problem, uh, a huge problem with prescription opioids. Um, uh, over the last uh, 13 years or so, there's been a great increase in the number of deaths from prescription opiates. If you look, um, it was it's a little hard to read the numbers, but it was about 17,000 in 2011, dropped a little bit in 12 and 13, but it's still real high. And along with that, if you look on the other side of the figure, there's uh, been a, a lot of op um, heroin being abused. And uh, a lot of people are going from heroin, uh, from prescription opiates to heroin. And so we have these two crises that are happening uh, um, in America. Um, and that's only the tip of the iceberg. I mean, for every person that dies from prescription opiates, there's uh, 10 are, tre are treated for abuse, uh, 32 emergency room visits. You can look at this, but there's a lot, it has a great big impact beyond just the, the large number of people that are dying from prescription opiates. Um, so this slide showing you how the prescription opiate epidemic is growing, but the other epidemic is pain. I mean, in, 2000, in 1999, uh, the uh, American Pain Society estimated that there were about 50 million Americans in chronic pain. IOM report has that doubled in about 12 years. I think that's real. I looked at the, how they got their data for both of the studies, and they, they did comparable analyses, and some of the data are the same groups of people, and the trend was happening uh, 10 years ago. So pain is not contagious. Uh, some people call me a carrier at work and things like that, but <laughs> um, something's going on here, and some of it's aging population, some is stress, some is um, uh, people gaining weight, but, but there's these are not only big crises, but they're, um, they're growing, and, and people are looking for solutions. Uh, one solution, and this is the simplified graph, I made it um, little kids on a um, seesaw just to, just to be oversimplified uh, uh, about this, but some people are um, trying to fight prescription opiate abuse at the expense of people in pain. And that doesn't seem fair. We shouldn't weigh one crisis against another and say you're not important because you're in pain and, and you, um, we, we, we're worried about prescription opiates and we're going to focus our attention on that. That's wrong. We really need, and this is where we're coming from at the NIH, is we need to do both. We need to fight prescription opiate abuse as much as possible and still not do it at the expense of people of pain. We have to worry about them too. So I'm going to um, describe a couple of things that we're involved with um, at the NIH, the pain consortium, and across the government, uh, some of these things too. One is education. Um, the, 
the healthcare providers in our country do not get, systematically, do not get a lot of education about how to treat pain, how to, how to prevent pain. Uh, and so they are then faced with um, patients that they um, have come to them and they don't have the tools. Some do, there, there's pain experts out there for sure, but the large majority do not. And if you look at how much pain education that uh, medical students get, four years medical school, in the United States, they get a median of seven hours of, or nine hours of education on pain over four years. This is 100 million Americans in chronic pain. They get, they get nine hours to figure it out, then go out there and help them. That, that's not enough. Canada is up to about 14 hours, but if you compare that to veterinary schools, at, at least in Canada, they get like 87 hours. Now something's wrong here, and I don't think the vets have it wrong. So what we're trying to do at the NIH with the pain consortium is to um, get more pain education into schools. And we, we can't, as the government, wave our government wand or something and just say, everybody teach pain and change the culture. It's hard to do that. So our strategy was to try to fund centers of excellence, and we did, across the nation where we found pain champions, people that wanted to change the culture, wanted to teach pain in their school and be, were being stopped or weren't being facilitated. Um, we wanted to enable them, give them some money, um, not a ton of money, but give them some money to bring more education into their, into their network of schools. These COPEs, as we call them, have three main um, objectives. One is to put um, courses in their classes, in their schools. Uh, second is to create online materials for teaching about pain. Um, and then, and so that other schools could take their materials and, and, and model after what the COPEs are doing and teach pain in their schools. And these are case-based kind of scenarios because they, um, they're considered, um, they're cutting edge in terms of education. Just giving a speech like this doesn't do as much as seeing somebody um, practice with a patient, seeing the pitfalls, seeing the successes with that. And then test and disseminate. Did what they do work in their schools? And go out and tell people at like the American Academy of Pain Medicine right across the street or across the river. Um, go out there and spread the word once you have success. So here's our initial uh, centers of excellence uh, pain champions from across the uh, country. We also have our government officials in there. I'm the most tired one in that picture. <laughs> but the reason, uh, the reason I show this is not just that there's a lot of people, but the energy was unbelievable. I mean, the government gives out big contracts at times, and people want the money. These people wanted to be part of this. We realized very quickly that there was more going on than just trying to get funds. It was a movement. They felt like changing the world and the culture of pain medicine. They, were, they, they wanted to be part of something important. The first case was created. It's Edna. Edna's, each one of these cases is like a riddle. It's, and just like a patient, you've got to figure them out. Edna has terrible back pain. And if you look at an x-ray of her back, it's a mess. But her pain's really not coming from her back. Most people her age, if you look at their back, it's a mess, and if she complains of back pain, you say, oh, the back's messed up. She has hip pain being referred to her um, back, and then with a special um, differential diagnosis test, they were able to identify it's the hip and to do behavioral therapies um, and, and, and the right drugs to help her with that. And, and, uh, and it, the modules seem very educational, but they tested it. And I won't go into details with this uh, because I don't want to run out of time, but they tested it in, these, in this another testing situation where um, um, the um, medical students would go to station to station to station and have simulated patients. And they were about the same as um, the people that took this module of Edna were about the same as the uh, medical students that did not take it, except when it came to back pain. They were much better. They passed a lot more. They were 20% more efficient in their in answers. So this was published, and that's part of the dissemination. Hey, we got Edna. She's online. Give her to you. Uh, have your students take this module, and they'll learn something. So that's important for us. We have all sorts of other modules coming down the pike. We envision that someday we'll have 
50, 100 of these teaching modules so that different schools can pick out what they want. Because you might not like Edna's message, but maybe you'll like Ms. Mr. Gateway's ma message. Maybe you'll like some other ones. So we, we want to make it as easy as possible for other schools to grab these materials and teach it the way they want to teach it. But we want them to teach it. And even if they don't use these, if they say we can do it better, that's fine. But we want them to teach pain. COPES are about to come back online. We redid the contracts in the month or so. Real excited. We have um, um, a lot more materials to create, and a lot more of this will be coming um, your way soon. So uh, keep your eye out for that. Another thing that we, we did, we do a lot of stuff, but uh, opiates. OK, are they good or are they bad? There's a bit of a fight about that out there in the field. We're, we're kind of in the middle. We get it from both sides because we're champion um, pain patients, but we also um, are worried about prescription drug abuse. A lot of arguing in the field. So we held this conference two and a half years in the making to, to do this conference. Um, it was like meeting after meeting and groups of people um, from across the government, from outside the government. And, but it was with, with a, a very um, clear purpose. And, that, and this is one of the panels from, from it. But the purpose was to um, get as unbiased look at the literature of opiates as possible. Without any, so anybody with a, with a dog in the fight, if you, if you will, was not on the panel. We actually had a, well, we had a, a year-long literature review of opioids, long-term. Um, what do we know? What can we pull out of the literature now? Then we had this panel of non-experts, real smart people, but they're not experts on opiates. They were a jury. And they reviewed the evidence from the report. They, looked, they listened to the speakers at the conference that were a uh, day and a half conference over at the NIH. And then they listened to the public. And they made some conclusions about opioids, about what they thought opiates' um, um, usefulness was. And um, let me just note one thing here, because I'll get back to this in a second. This is a panel of people with very different opinions about opioids. And me, I was trying to keep a blank slate. But, um, they really didn't disagree that much. The, the people that didn't like opiates were still saying, well, we should use them once in a while, sure, but we need comprehensive pain treatments. And the people that were more pro-opioids opioids were saying, well, yeah, we should use them, but not just them. So I, I think that there's not quite as much controversy as, you, as one might think and from, from the rhetoric that's out there. Um, these are, our jury came up with conclusions. They weren't conclusions about opiates that were earth-shattering, but they were more common sense, that we need some, some sort of um, harmonized guidelines. People, instead of different states, everybody coming up with different rules, maybe we need to get together and come up with some guidelines together. We need more re um, research. We need better tools for assessing risk and things like that. And that's, those are actionable items, and those are things that we're going to do with the government. And so we're hoping that even though these weren't earth-shattering results, they're, they're going to help guide us in the right direction. Um, right, before, right before the opiate conference, the day before, there was a protest right out there, wherever the mall is, um, against opiates. And they were looking for the cause. They're, they're trying to find, these are people that lost loved ones to opiates. And it was, it was heart-wrenching, and they were looking, pointing their fingers, and the speakers were pointing fingers at the government, at Obama, at the FDA, at drug companies, trying to find the cause of prescription drug abuse uh, epidemic. And I don't think they were pointing the fingers really in the right direction. Um, I'd like to note, this is a slide from the conference that I put on, that we're doing a lot, and others are doing a lot to fight prescription drug abuse. I don't have time, I have my five minutes. Uh, sign held up. But all these different things are being done in terms of educational, different therapies, smart pills, uh, uh, to help fight prescription drug abuse. We're doing everything we can in the government, everything we can think of. If you have better ideas, let us know. But we're also doing everything we can to fight chronic pain. And what I thought was kind of interesting, very interesting, and really got me thinking around the opiate meeting, is that those things, a lot of them are the same. I mean, if you're, a lot of things you do to fight alternative therapies, um, uh, abuse deterrent formulations, keeping an eye on how many prescriptions the person has, all these things not only help stop prescription opiate abuse, but they also help stop pain patients. Why? 
Why the same thing? Why are, I know they're intertwined phenomena, but why are they so mixed? And so we just published, the NIH Pain Consortium um, uh, um, just published a paper where we kind of give the explanation. And our explanation is that the reason we have prescription drug abuse problem in the country is that there's inadequate pain treatment. If, if comprehensive pain treatment was the rule, not the exception, where you use all sorts of methods, behavioral therapies, physical therapies, drugs, alternative therapies, um, a massage, you name it. If we, if we had a country that where, and a system that reinforced that sort of treatment, then people couldn't just go to a doctor and say, hey, give me some drugs. Okay, your back's bad, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a bag of them, or here's a prescription. You'd have to go through rigorous um, treatment, and it wouldn't be that easy to get the drugs if you're a drug seeker. And pain patients in that system, they would thrive. They would do much better pain-wise, and maybe that 100 million number would go down to the 50 million number again. So my last two slides is just talking about, you know, I'm saying what if. Wouldn't it be nice if culture changed, society changed? We're doing some things, but that's just me talking at a podium here. But as part of the Affordable Care Act, the uh, Institute of Medicine um, came up with the, uh, their report in 2011. It had some big proposals in there on how to change America. This one is Proposal 2.2 that went to DHHS, DHHS came to the NIH, came to another committee, which a um, uh, pain committee that we're very involved with, and said, um, figure out how to do this thing. And this was saying change how pain's treated in America, how from reimbursement to uh, education to, to research, how do we make sweeping changes? We formed a committee that had five subcommittees that had 25 sub subcommittees and, and we're, we're working on what we call the National Pain Strategy and that is to in, increase public education about pain, increase professional education, population research, prevention, care, disparities, and services reimbursement. That is, that report was done by us last summer. It was submitted to DHHS and it's coming out, I keep saying, any time now, but now it's going to be very, very soon. So we hope that when this comes out, it leads, um, they'll put meat on the bones. DHHS hopefully put money, who does what, and that we can get some of these sweeping changes that will help both pain patients, but I think because not treating pain real well is probably a lot of the cause of prescription opiate abuse, it'll also help stop prescription opiate abuse. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask our speakers to uh, join us up st on stage and hopefully our um, discussant uh, is able to join us. And after some brief conversation, we'll turn it over to you. And there are mics on either side of the aisles, and we'll invite you, uh, your questions. Uh, we, uh, I hadn't mentioned this earlier, but there is a reception right afterwards, right outside the auditorium. We hope you'll join us and the speakers um, for that purpose. So uh, while she is coming up, let me introduce the, the, the fourth uh, uh, speaker in our uh, group, and that is uh, Cindy Steinberg, who is National Director of Policy and Advocacy at the U.S. Pain Foundation and Chair of the Policy Council in the Massachusetts Pain Initiative, and she's going to get wired up. And if you look at her bio, you will see that she is very, a very active activist in the pain community and herself is a pain sufferer. But Ms. Steinberg, I'm going to ask, since you've had a chance to listen to all of them and they've had their say, I thought I would begin by asking you the first question, and that is from the perspective of science and policy, what is it that the patient community would most like to see happen in the next few years? That is, where should science and policy be going with regard to chronic pain? Okay, thank you. First of all, I want to thank all the three speakers here. 
um, David, for your great review of neuroscience and your work in basic neuroscience, and, and for your work and really interesting empathy with people with pain and trying to inform your neuroscience work with that. And Dave, for the education work that you've been doing. Sure. Okay. Let's try this. Okay. Can you hear me now? Is that better? I'll hold it. Okay. So first, I just wanted to thank all the speakers for their work. So David, for his review of neuroscience work now, which was really encouraging um, and exciting for people living with pain. And for Ed, for the work that he's been doing in pharmacology, informed by empathy for people with pain, which is a really great approach. And also for, for Dave, for the work he's doing in educating healthcare providers, which has been a real problem, as we know. Um, and also your balance in the issue of, of opioids. And I really appreciate that. So to answer the question that Mark posed, which was, where should the science and policy be going? And my answer would be really exactly where these three speakers have taken us today. And what I mean by that is we really need to accelerate research into the neuroscience and the neurobiological basis of the disease of chronic pain. And I think we need to create much greater awareness of the neuroscience of pain um, with events like this, and some geared more to the public than even this event is. And I think that would accomplish a couple things. One is um, I think it would help the public and policymakers view chronic pain as the widespread and pervasive and devastating disease that it is. You know, quite apart from the original etiology of the pain, you know, what I see when I run support groups for people with pain is regardless of whether somebody's coming in with migraine or trigeminal neuralgia or fibromyalgia or back pain, um, all these different conditions, CRPS, their experience of the pain and what it does to their lives is very similar, is shockingly similar in many cases. And so what that really makes me think um, and really know is that there's a neurological basis to this disease, regardless of what the original cause is. I think people, in the general public don't even don't realize that. And we talk to each other, and I think we all do really recognize that, but I don't think um, there's a real perception of that. And I think also accelerating research is gonna help reduce stigma, um, because the more we learn through research, I think the less um, stigma will persist, some of which is often you know, accusing people of pain, of malingering, or of exaggerating um, their symptoms, it's pretty awful um, to live in existence where 24 seven you're in pain. And, and many people in pain literally live like that. It's like, it's like being trapped um, in a prison, but it's, it's kind of worse than that. It's being trapped in a prison where you're being tortured 24 um, seven. It's a really difficult life. Um, and I think that the more people get that, um, this is really a disease, um, stigma will uh, be less. And of course, the more, the more treatment options we have, um, the better it's gonna be, um, particularly novel treatments um, and maybe even a cure for chronic pain someday. Um, and finally, I think giving healthcare providers more confidence, some of the training that you're doing, but also some of the neurobiology, if they understand that better, I think that they won't be as frustrated as they are now, um, as fearful as they are now, and even reluctant to treat people with pain, not knowing what to do. Um, when this, I first had an accident 15 years ago, and I started seeking treatment for my pain, and after five years of looking for some help, I realized that pain treatment was like at the stage of the doctor actually being blindfolded and throwing darts at a, a bullseye and just hoping something was gonna hit the target somewhere. And that's kinda like what it's been like, um, and I'm hoping that all the neuroscience work we're doing um, can really improve things. Well, thank you very much. Um, may I ask the speakers, David, we'll start with you. Um, 
Any reactions to that? Anything you want to add or reemphasize? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think there's a huge conundrum here. Uh, the first is um, defining the pain phenotype, which we do very badly, and and so we, we're not even sure what what we're treating and whether a good outcome is meaningful in terms of that domain. And the second thing is a circular argument that's very hard in the field, and that is, you know, I love your DART um, it, uh, ex thesis, because that's what it is. But the problem is, if you're a pain clinician, even a well-trained pain clinician, there's no, there's no really good treatment out there. And if you look at programs in Sweden and, and Holland and other Nordic countries where they have the finances or uh, smarts, at least in the past, to create multidisciplinary programs, they seem to do better. But the thing is that we're, we're using multidisciplinary also as a garbage can in the sense that very few outcome studies are done in the domains of what we use. So in psychology, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy has recently made it to, to control trials. But many of the procedures that people get have no, have no outcome studies, and yet they're done. And I think that's a big problem. And uh, I'll save my comments for opioids later, but I, I think that is a good example of knowing the biology of a drug. And, and somehow, as a society, we haven't jumped at going to the moon on it. In, in general, like, like the same thing with pain. If pain is such a big problem in the United States and it's costing so much money, any business person would say, well, if it's costing this much money, how much money is it going to cost to solve one or two aspects of it? And there's some bigger problems. I mean, uh, the perioperative process is one um, that, that can take away a chunk of the, of the 100 million, as you alluded to. So I think it's very difficult uh, to, to deal with because our armamentarium is, is so limited. You know, we, we're using arrows or darts to throw at tanks, or a tank. Dr. Bielski, anything, any further thoughts about all this? Yeah, so I'd start with the stigma, and uh, if we could give it a biological basis, if we have definitive biomarkers, which I think we're getting to the point of spectroscopy and, and the fMRI and, and others, uh, that is going to destigmatize it, at least with the medical profession, uh, maybe then the public will start to treat it as, as a disease, which it is. Uh, and so that's where the roles of basic and clinical research, I think, can help in that. Uh, your, other, your DART analogy, you know, I think about my own father who stuck with, he had a trust with his provider, the pain specialist, and she trusted him back. And it was trial and error for many, many, many months, including these very uh, painful procedures, the injections and the ablations in particular and the, the opioid therapies that they tried. Um, I'm not sure why the back uh, brace was the, one of the last things tried. Hopefully with me speaking about it, more people will try some of the, you know, the I would say more conventional uh, tried and true methods. Um, and, and also not you know, have a closed mind on things that the patient might be very open-minded to try. Acupuncture, massage therapy, um, chronic pain support groups. Uh, you know, if we can advocate for those things, the things that don't cost a lot of money, that don't have a lot of risk involved with them, try them. They might not work for every patient, uh, and then stick with it. You know, build that relationship with your primary care physician and with your specialists that, uh, you know, that you're in it for the long haul together. Um, then you can overcome obstacles and, you know, disappointments, hopefully with, you know, ultimately success. Dr. Thomas, any thoughts? Yeah, I could. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, could, could comment on a lot of things, but I really keyed in on how you don't see pain, how, how people don't understand how much pain pain patients are in. And it's constant. And it, it, it can be sporadic, but it's in the night, then in the morning, then it, and it just keeps going. Paul is in pain right now. Um, and that, I think, is something our society doesn't understand. It's like cultural denial or the, a blind spot, spot to, to that whole whole issue, and, and there's the mindset of, well, you know, I have pain, just suck it up or stuff like that. You don't have pain like that. I don't have pain, I, I don't have pain like that. So to really, if we could get society to understand better what's going on, maybe they'd be more empathetic. 
And just a side note um, on that, I just saw the movie Cake a couple weeks ago, and it was like, thank goodness, somebody finally put this story out in the public. And it's not getting the best reviews, 50-50 or something, but I think it's because it's a hard topic. And uh, I actually talked to the writer today, and he's very much concerned about people in pain. He's asking, how can he help? So I think part of the way, and this is a difficult problem, and there's not just one solution, but part of it is we could get that message out to the public that this is real, constant, and, and it's, um, and, and get them to have to deal with it more, and not just leave it to the people suffering alone. So, Dr. Morris, so before, before you ask your question, if those of you who have questions, if you'd go to the mics immediately after this, we can go ahead and call on some of you. So please go ahead to the mics. Go ahead, Dr. Borsa. I mean, I think part of the problem is that the, the patient and the, the treating crew are speaking different languages and don't understand each other. So I, I had complex regional pain syndrome, which uh, I had for a year, and I found two things happen. So I'm not the biggest idiot in Boston, but close. So I, had, I kind of had a sense of what the problem was. And I found it very difficult, even though I trained in pain, to explain to my clinicians what it was. It wasn't just the pain. And yet the language is, is inadequate in terms of your understanding my pain. And I think that's part of the problem. And for me, the migraine example is a good one. You know, you have a migraine and you look terrible and what have you, but you're better now. So from my point of view, the silence or invisibility of the disease uh, is there at some point, and yet you are still a sufferer because you're fearing the next attack and so forth. And so these components can be addressed in any chronic pain condition, and I think it's very hard. Uh, we need an, a language that is common and, and can capture all, all the things, especially that you brought up in terms of empathy and, and what have you. Okay, with that, let, we have a couple of people at the mics. Let's go there first. Oh. Would you identify yourself, please? Um, my name is Kamal Johnson. I'm a clinical health psychologist in the Washington, D.C. area. And I was curious in terms of the, our receptivity in the uh, field at this point of looking at in, and incorporating the biopsychosocial model uh, in addition to the biomedical model. And also I wanted to uh, inquire regarding the emphasis in terms of clinical outcomes and looking in addition to pain, but also matters pertaining to quality of life and functional status. Who wants to tackle that? Dr. Bielski, you look ready. <laughs> I'm just thinking the comparing and contrasting of Paula, who was misdiagnosed 18 months later, then a lot of pills were thrown at her, uh, versus Amelia, who I, I, I you know, after I had met the family, learned about her story, I felt compelled to go down and reach out to the Boston Children's Hospital and their pediatric pain clinic. And we, we have a video that's on our website now. If you email me, I'll share the link. We're going to try to widely disseminate this with NIH's help. Uh, this 11-year-old girl in seven minutes will teach you more about the treatment of chronic pain from a multidisciplinary approach that worked than uh, any of us can do in an hour of, of lecturing. Uh, it's that powerful, and it's convinced me uh, to spend more of my energy outside of my biochemical lab, pharmacology lab, learning about what all the different health professions can do for people, and then try to widely disseminate it. I mean, I think the, the issue of recept, uh, recept, you know, being receptive in the field is uh, one that's driven by, by two things. One is how much money I can make and how much data there is. And, I, and I, th I know that's a cynical view, but I think it's, it's part of pain in America, is that it's a very lucrative profession for many. Mm. And so uh, I think what's happening is when uh, data comes out, like in a, a recent New England Journal paper uh, looking at epidural steroids for, for spinal stenosis, I mean, they weren't bold enough to say it doesn't work. They just said it doesn't work compared with local anesthetic. But the point being is that as these outcome studies drive us to new domains where I, I believe it'll be true that many of the things we use uh, may only be useful for a small or certain population, but other things will be more useful. And I think th the notion is exemplified in cognitive behavioral therapy. The data is very strong now. 
and, and more and more groups uh, and physicians or, or clinicians in the field are beginning to embrace it. The real issue goes back to what I think David mentioned in his, his talk, is how does the healthcare system uh, 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 deal with it and cope with it? And, and I don't know what it's like in Washington, but try getting a psychologist to treat kids or others in Boston. It's, it's very difficult. Not, okay. not because they're bad at it, but because they're not enough. Let me uh, go over here for a question, please. Hi, my name is uh, Joseph Rauschecker. I'm a basic scientist working at Georgetown University Medical Center, and I'm heading a, a research group on tinnitus or tinnitus. And um, we've been lucky enough to uh, have some interesting findings related to the brain changes in, in tinnitus. And um, I, I didn't know until a few years ago, until I met people like Vanya Abkarian and Marcus Blona working in the, in the research, uh, research on chronic pain, how similar the changes are that we've discovered in, in the tinnitus field to, to what uh, Dr. Borsuk in particular summarized so beautifully in his talk about brain imaging in, in chronic pain. So we, for example, we've seen nucleus accumbens involved and uh, prefrontal cortex involved. So I'm wondering whether there is any, I, I would go as far as saying Tinnitus is a form of chronic pain in the auditory domain. And so I wonder whether you had any additional insights into that and whether there, there is any way to join forces even and uh, tackle our problem in the same way as, as you tackle yours, which is, I think, very fascinating. How much money do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Not much. <laughs> Uh, I think from the NIH perspective, looking at overlapping conditions, not looking at pain as just putting in a little box, but looking at how different conditions, how um, depression, anxiety, sleeplessness, pain, drug abuse, tinnitus, how all these kind of fit together because we tend not to get diseases in little boxes. They tend to be spread and continuum. And, and so research-wise, I think that's the direction the NIH is interested in going, and that, but making the actual connections with the researchers, um, a lot of that is, is you guys. Right, we uh, uh, we uh, have time for one more question. Please, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Mona Miller. I'm with the Society for Neuroscience, and I wanted to follow up on the question about the armament, um, and specifically the basic science arg uh, armament. One of the areas of emphasis uh, currently at NIH and elsewhere is uh, the development of new tools and technologies that can be uh, deployed across the field to make um, more rapid strides. And I wonder if you uh, survey what's coming down the pike in terms of tools and technologies in the neuroscience field, what is most exciting um, for the opportunities uh, for application to the pain research community, and whether some things like optogene optogenetics and uh, clarity and other tools that are um, now with us are holding real promise for research and kind of what the near-term research agenda looks like at the basic neurobiological level. Oh, that's Mark a big uh, So <laughs> succinctly. Th yeah. So I think the field is now understanding neural circuits and how they uh, can be massaged or managed. And uh, I just briefly touched on you know, work from Aziz and his group uh, in, um, in Oxford where people are beginning to use you know, neurostimulators deep in the brain. And, and I think there's an example of this in depression, which I think will apply to pain soon, where in depression-resistant patients, uh, an area of the brain known as the habenula, which is a small nucleus at the back of the thalamus, uh, has been stimulated now in a number of patients uh, and, and has brought them out of their severe depression. I, I think the issue is that right now, we're looking for an orchestra with a conductor who may know what the music is, and for people to actually uh, conduct it in a way that that it's in, in, in a, a done in a, a rational and programmatic manner. So uh, what seemed obvious in yesteryear of stimulating thalamic and other areas that were part of the sensory system of pain didn't work out. And it's the kind of mistake that happened in neurosurgery that ended up treating Parkinson's patients with the subthalamic nucleus as, as, as a, a very reasonable uh, uh, approach. You know, it may not be perfect, but it, it certainly has, has helped many patients in that way. So I think what's happening is now the ability to intervene and look at brain changes over time. 
And, and, and just as the, there are these procedures, it's the same thing with placebo. You can think of it as a stimula, you know, brain stimulator, but how do we maintain it? And that's been one of the biggest problems in the field is that, you know, yes, the placebo effect does this and that, but I'm a chronic pain patient, and how do you, as a clinician or treater of my condition, maintain the, uh, the clouds in the sky, whatever? Any other the scientists want to comment? Well, just uh, you, you talked about the NIH, and um, I don't want to get real specific about what technology we like the best, but we like technologies. I mean, especially, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like toys in a way. But um, if the technology can help people in pain, help us prevent pain, help us treat pain, um, we, we, we like those things. So um, I, th I think the future will have all these um, we'll, be, we'll be funding all sorts of new technologies, and we're not quite sure what's gonna, what the science will look like in, in 20 years, but it's, go, it's gonna be very technologically advanced. And it, it's kind of like that expression, um, um, you look at science fiction from 20 years from now, and it's like, you don't know if it's gonna be true, but whatever happens in 20 years, it's gonna be, feel like science fiction if we look, could look ahead to it. So um, the future does depend a lot on a lot of things, but technology is part of what we support. Um, and and we, we certainly want to capitalize on what it can give us. I had mentioned magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy is just one of these high-tech approaches that just offers an insight into the brain that we've previously not been able to do. But don't rely completely on technology. There's got to be balance. I think the pharma industry has seen with all of the exuberance of molecular biology and knockout mouse models and uh, you know, proteomics and genomics. Uh, you know, we threw a lot of high-tech uh, throughput screening of, of drugs that didn't result in a lot more drugs that are helping people. We need to go back to some of the rational drug design that I mentioned in the 50s and the 60s. We need to listen to the patients and what are the most problematic aspects of chronic pain from a functional recovery point. What would you like to be doing again that you're not currently doing? And that goes back to the first question, which of what, what do you want the outcome to be, other than just a zero to 10 scale. And, and that's, that's real important to get achievable goals and to look at more than just the pain, how they're functioning. We ultra, ultra specialized in our own disciplines. We need to go back up a little level or two and talk to the people doing tinnitus research or depression research, long-term potentiation, looking at different model organism systems and gain insights that we otherwise wouldn't be aware of. It might be that magical breakthrough moment mm -hmm. that gives us clarity on a, on a particular aspect of chronic pain. Cindy, would you like uh, the final word? Sure, sure I would. Um, and just an answer to that and also one of the questions. Um, I think that it is very possible to live a qu good quality of life even with severe chronic pain. And I think what people need is an empathetic practitioner uh, who will work with you a support group of other people that live with pain as well, because I've seen that do wonders for people when they understand they're not alone. Chronic pain is very isolating. Oftentimes you can't participate in, in social activities like other people can. Um, you tend to be uh, housebound often. So support groups are incredibly helpful for people. And trying every possible thing, unfortunately that's where the state of the art is right now. And you need to combine a number of things together um, to help you, and each one may be reducing the pain 10%, 10% here, 10% there, and you can have a, a good quality of life. And we'll hope that with the science ahead of us, um, there might be a cure someday. Well, on that note, please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you.